The Pearl, Chapter 2. The town lay on a broad estuary, its old yellow plastered buildings hugging the beach. And on the beach, the white and blue canoes that came from Nariot were drawn up, canoes preserved for generations by a hard shell-like waterproof plaster whose making was a secret of the fishing people. They were high and graceful canoes with curving bow and stern and a brace section midships where a mast could be stepped to carry a small lanteen sail. The beach was yellow sand, but at the water's edge a rubble of shell and algae took its place. Fiddler crabs bubbled and sputtered in their holes in the sand, and in the shallows little lobsters popped in and out of their tiny homes in the rubble and sand. The sea bottom was rich with crawling and swimming and growing things. The brown algae waved in the gentle currents, and the green eel grass swayed, and little seahorses clung to its stems. Spotted Boti, the poison fish, lay on the bottom in the eel grass beds, and the bright colored swimming crabs scampered over them. On the beach, the hungry dogs and the hungry pigs of the town searched endlessly for any dead fish or seabird that might have floated in on a rising tide. Although the morning was young, the hazy mirage was up. The uncertain air that magnified some things and blotted out others hung over the whole gulf so that all sights were unreal and vision could not be trusted, so that sea and land had the sharp clarities and the vagueness of a dream. Thus, it might be that the people of the gulf trust things of the spirit and things of the imagination, but they do not trust their eyes to show them distance or clear outline or any optical exactness. Across the estuary from the town, one section of mangroves stood clear and telescopically defined, while another mangrove clump was a hazy black-green blob. Part of the far shore disappeared into a shimmer that looked like water. There was no certainty in seeing, no proof that what you saw was there or was not there. And the people of the Gulf expected all places were that way, and it was not strange to them. A copper haze hung over the water, and the hot morning sun beat on it and made it vibrate blindingly. The brush houses of the fishing people were back from the beach on the right-hand side of the town, and the canoes were drawn up in the front of this area. Kino and Juana came slowly down to the beach into Kino's canoe, which was the one thing of value he owned in the world. It was very old. Kino's grandfather had bought it from Nairet, and he had given it to Kino's father, and so it had come to Kino. It was at once property and source of food, for a man with a boat can guarantee a woman that she will eat something. It is the bulk word against starvation. And every year Kino refinished his canoe with the hard shell-like plaster by the secret method that had also come to him from his father. Now he came to the canoe, and he touched the bow tenderly as he always did. He laid his diving rock and his blanket and the two ropes in the sand by the canoe, and he folded his blanket and laid it in the bow. Juana laid Coyotito on the blanket, and she placed her shawl over him so that the hot sun could not shine on him. He was quiet now, but the swelling on his shoulder had continued up his neck and under his ear, and his face was puffed and feverish. Juana went to the water and waded in. She gathered some brown seaweed and made a flat, damp poultice of it, and this she applied to the baby's swollen shoulder, which was as good a remedy as any, and probably better than the doctor could have done. But the remedy lacked his authority because it was simple and didn't cost anything. The stomach cramps had not come to Coyotita. Perhaps Juana had sucked out the poison in time, but she had not sucked out her worry over her firstborn. She had not prayed directly for the recovery of the baby. She had prayed that they might find a pearl with which to hire the doctor to cure the baby, for the minds of people are as unsubstantial as the mirage of the gulf. Now Kino and Juana slid the canoe down the beach to the water, and when the boat floated, Juana climbed in, while Kino pushed the stern in and waded beside it until it floated lightly and trembled on the little breaking waves. Then, in coordination, Juana and Kino drove their double-bladed paddles into the sea, 
and the canoe creased the water and hissed with speed. The other perlers were gone out long since. In a few moments, Kino could see them clustered in the haze, riding over the oyster bed. Light filtered down through the water to the bed where the frilly pearl oysters lay, fastened to the rubbly bottom, a bottom strewn with shells of broken, opened oysters. This was the bed that had raised the King of Spain to be a great power in Europe in past years, had helped to pay for his wars, and had decorated the churches for his soul's sake. The gray oysters with ruffles like skirts on the shells, the barnacle-crusted oysters with little bits of weed clinging to the skirts, and small crabs climbing over them. An accident could happen to these oysters. A grain of sand could lie in the folds of mussel and irritate the flesh until, in self-protection, the flesh coated the grain with a layer of smooth cement. But once started, the flesh continued to coat the foreign body until it fell free in some tidal flurry or until the oyster was destroyed. For centuries, men had dived down and torn the oysters from the beds and ripped them open, looking for the coated grains of sand. Swarms of fish lived by the bed to live near the oysters thrown back by the searching men and to nibble at the shining inner shells. But the pearls were accidents, and the finding of one was luck, a little pat on the back by God, or the gods, or both. Kino had two ropes, one tied to a heavy stone and one to a basket. He stripped off his shirt and trousers and laid his hat in the bottom of the canoe. The water was oily smooth. He took his rock in one hand and his basket in the other, and he slipped feet first over the side, and the rock carried him to the bottom. The bubbles rose behind him until the water cleared and he could see. Above, the surface of the water was an undulating mirror of brightness, and he could see the bottoms of the canoes sticking through it. Kino moved cautiously so that the water would not be obscured with mud or sand. He hooked his foot in the loop on his rock, and his hands worked quickly, tearing the oysters loose, some singly, others in clusters. He laid them in his basket. In some places, the oysters clung to one another so that they came free in lumps. Now, Kino's people had sung of everything that had happened or existed. They had made songs to the fishes, to the sea in anger and to the sea in calm, to the light and the dark and the sun and the moon, and the songs were all in Kino and in his people. Every song that had ever been made, even the ones forgotten. And as he filled his basket, the song was in Kino, and the beat of the song was his pounding heart as it ate the oxygen from his held breath. And the melody of the song was the gray-green water and the little skirting animals and the clouds of fish that flitted by and were gone. But in the song there was a secret little inner song, hardly perceptible, but always there, sweet and secret and clinging, almost hiding in the counter-melody, and this was the song of the pearl that might be. For every shell thrown in the basket might contain a pearl. Chance was against it, but luck and the gods might be for it. And in the canoe above him, Kino knew that Juana was making the magic of prayer, her face set rigid and her muscles hard to force the luck, to tear the luck out of the gods' hands, for she needed the luck for the swollen shoulder of Coyotito. And because the need was great and the desire was great, the little secret melody of the pearl that might be was stronger this morning. Whole phrases of it came clearly and softly into the song of the undersea. Kino, in his pride and youth and strength, could remain down over two minutes without strain, so that he worked deliberately, selecting the largest shells. Because they were disturbed, the oyster shells were tightly closed. A little to his right, a hummock of rubby rock stuck up, covered with young oysters not ready to take. Kino moved next to the hummock, and then beside it, under a little overhang, he saw a very large oyster lying by itself, not covered with its clinging brothers. 
The shell was partly open, for the overhang protected this ancient oyster, and in the lip-like muscle, Kino saw a ghostly gleam. And then the shell closed down. His heart beat out a heavy rhythm, and the melody of the maybe pearl shrilled in his ears. Slowly, he forced the oyster loose and held it tightly against his breath. He kicked his foot free from the rock loop, and his body rose to the surface, and his black hair gleamed in the sunlight. He reached over the side of the canoe and laid the oyster in the bottom. Then Juana steadied the boat while he climbed in. His eyes were shining with excitement, but in decency he pulled up his rock, and then he pulled up his basket of oysters and lifted them in. Juana sensed his excitement, and she pretended to look away. It is not good to want a thing too much. It sometimes drives the luck away. You must want it just enough, and you must be very tactful with God or the gods. But Juana stopped breathing. Very deliberately, Kino opened his short, strong knife. He looked speculatively at the basket. Perhaps it would be better to open the oyster last. He took a small oyster from the basket, cut the mussel, searched the folds of the flesh, and threw it in the water. Then he seemed to see the great oyster for the first time. He squatted in the bottom of the canoe, picked up the shell, and examined it. The flutes were shining black to brown, and only a few small barnacles adhered to the shell. Now Kino was reluctant to open it. What he had seen, he knew might be a reflection, a piece of flat shell accidentally drifted in, or a complete illusion. In this gulf of uncertain light, there were more illusions than realities. But Juana's eyes were on him, and she could not wait. She put her hand on Coyotito's covered head. Open it, she said softly. Kino deftly slipped his knife into the edge of the shell. Through the knife, he could feel the muscle tighten hard. He worked the blade lever-wise, and the closing muscle parted, and the shell fell apart. The lip-like flesh writhed up and then subsided. Kino lifted the flesh, and there it lay, the great pearl, perfect as the moon. It captured the light and refined it and gave it back in silver incandescence. It was as large as a seagull's egg. It was the greatest pearl in the world. Juana caught her breath and moaned a little. And to Kino, the secret melody of the maybe pearl broke clear and beautiful, rich and warm and lovely, glowing and gloating and triumphant. In the surface of the great pearl, he could see dream forms. He picked the pearl from the dying flesh and held it in his palm, and he turned it over and saw that its curve was perfect. Juana came near to stare at it in his hand. And it was the hand he had smashed against the doctor's gate. And the torn flesh of the knuckles was turned grayish white by the seawater. Instinctively, Juana went to Coyotito where he lay on his father's blanket. She lifted the poultice of seaweed and looked at the shoulder. Kino, she cried shrilly. He looked past his pearl, and he saw that the swelling was going out of the baby's shoulder. The poison was receding from its body. Then Kino's fist closed over the pearl, and his emotion broke over him. He put back his head and howled. His eyes rolled up, and he screamed, and his body was rigid. The men in the other canoes looked up, startled, and then they dug their paddles into the sea and raced toward Kino's canoe.